What's up, party people? Welcome back to the channel. Today, we're going to be taking a closer look at AMD's, one of AMD's brand new stock coolers that comes bundled with the R7 1700, and that is the Wraith Spire. And this is not to be confused with the Wraith, the original Wraith that AMD launched a year or two ago, nor is it to be confused with the Wraith Max, which is the other new stock cooler from AMD that comes bundled with the 1800X and the 1700X. Now, it's perfectly reasonable for you to be wondering, why am I doing a standalone video on a stock cooler? That seems more or less uninteresting, and it might be for some of you, but the way I see it is that the R7 1700 is probably the most appealing of the three Ryzen chips right now of the R7 family uh, due to its lower price point at 330 MSRP uh, and the fact that you can overclock the crap out of it and pretty much get similar performance on par with the 1800X for a fraction of the cost. So with that in mind, users looking to buy the 1700 are also probably checking out the included Spire cooler thinking, well, is that cooler really good enough, or is it cool enough, or quiet enough, or should I just throw in the towel right now and assume that I'm going to have to buy a $30, $40, $50 cooler anyway? So that's what we're really going to answer today. Now, with that said, let's dive into some of the basic specs of the Wraith Spire, starting with its TDP of 95 watts, which is actually fairly nice because we uh, only have a 65 watt TDP on the Ryzen CPU. The 1700 is a fairly low power chip, so the fact that AMD has bundled a 95 watt TDP cooler with it means that they've actually kept overclocking and overclockers in mind uh, with this particular launch. So that's actually really nice. We're going to have additional headroom to take the chip a bit further. You may have also noticed that the Spire is significantly smaller than both the Wraith and Wraith Max. Uh, and that's actually a really good thing because the one complaint that the big complaint that I had with the original Max, uh, the original Wraith cooler was that it was so freakishly large that it was intruding on the RAM clearance. And actually you couldn't even install uh, the leftmost DIMM properly uh, unless you had like a like a full ATX board because with a with a small form factor board you just had all that componentry being squeezed together on the PCB and uh, it was creating all these sort of clearance issues between the cooler itself and the memory you're not getting that at all with the Spire regardless of what form factor motherboard you're dealing with so I think that's a huge plus overall the other thing I want to mention is that the fan itself uh, on the Spire is 92 millimeters it's actually fairly large for a stock cooler these days uh, very much modeling after the Wraith in that sense uh, but it's also so fairly quiet as we will see uh, a bit later and that is being controlled by a four pin PWM fan header which is also nice to see. The Spire also comes included with a second cable that's got a four pin connector that plugs directly into the RGB header on your motherboard should you have one and that's just to control the RGB ring that goes around the fan. We're not going to be diving into any customization or, or t demoing that at all. This is more so about the performance again uh, but if you were to control or configure that the LED uh, you would have to go into the appropriate motherboard manufacturer software. So if you had a crosshair Asus board, you'd have to use Aura. If you were on a, a MSI motherboard like I am, it'd be the MSI gaming app and so forth. But um, pretty cool to see some a uh, little bit of bling factor on a stock cooler for once. That is pretty sweet. However, of course, you don't have to enable that. You can just not use the cable. Don't plug that in. And all of a sudden, it's, uh, it's, it's completely um, unilluminated. So the last bit to discuss here is mounting. And the Spire actually mounts to the motherboard very easily. It probably takes 10 to 15 seconds to do. And at first, it looks like it does it the same way as the Intel stock coolers with push pins. But that's actually not the case. These are, in fact, uh, just regular Phillips head screws that screw directly into an AM4 backplate that goes behind the PCB, of course, of the motherboard. And installation is just a breeze. It's super simple, straightforward, and it works properly. It's less awkward than the push pins on the Intel side, and it's much less awkward than the stupid uh, seesaw bar, the seesaw retention bar that we that we find on older AMD uh, and also the, uh, the Wraith coolers as well. And I think now we can talk about some of the testing. So testing hardware first off, we're rocking an MSI X370 X Power Gaming Titanium motherboard. That is just way too long for, for a name. Uh, we've also got a GTX 1070 that's rocking a Founders Edition stock frequencies, 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance LPX, DDR4, of course, which is one of the few uh, DDR4 kits that's validated for Ryzen. And then we've also got a LEPA 1600 watt power supply, a 512 gig SX900 SSD from ADATA, which we're using as a fresh clean install boot drive. It's, it's a really fresh drive. There's really not much else on it other than the essentials. And uh, of course the Wraith Spire and all that jazz. So that's pretty much gonna do it for our testing setup. We are rocking Windows 10 64 bit, of course, with the latest NVIDIA drivers 378.66. Oh, all right, and um, testing. So I fired up the test bed for the first time, everything running stock. The Wraith cooler is at its stock, whatever 
default curve that it runs at, uh, and the 1700 is running at stock frequencies, which it precision boosts up to 3.2 gigahertz on all cores under multi-threaded workload. So that's what we were rocking there. So for this initial test, we fired up GTA 5 at max settings, 2560 by 1440, 2X MSAA. And what we found after about 20 minutes of gameplay was that the CPU temperatures were staying in the low 60s, and that's in degrees Celsius, of course, which is fairly reasonable. Granted, we aren't putting a huge thermal uh, burden on the CPU just yet because we haven't overclocked it at all. But uh, I mean, the fan is just running on auto. We haven't maxed out the fan speed on the Spire by any means. And I guess I was just expecting a little bit worse in terms of thermal performance than what we're seeing here. I mean, it's not super chilly in my room or anything. Ambient temps aren't, uh, they, they could always be lower, but uh, actually a fairly good uh, start for the Wraith Spire. But now let's see how it performs when we crank things up on the multiplier. I got the chip stable at 3.9 gigahertz at 1.3 volts. Of course, CPU Z was reading it a little bit higher at 1.312. Um, but uh, overall very, very consistent uh, on the V-Core. And then I fired up GTA 5 once again, all the same settings, and saw the core temps start to spike up. I mean, they just started climbing the ladder. Uh, once they hit about 80 degrees Celsius, I rebooted into the BIOS and I just cranked the Wraith fan, uh, the, the, uh, the Spire fan, up to 100%. And before you start judging and, and start thinking, well, it's probably gonna sound like a turbine engine at this point, it actually doesn't. The, the Spire fan is incredibly quiet. Even at 100% fan speed, I was, remarkably impressed by how quiet it was. Um, I, I actually had my, uh, again, my, my AC, my window AC unit running at the time when I uh, cranked the fan to 100, and I literally had to put my ear to the cooler to make sure that it was actually taking effect um, because it was just being drowned out by the, the window AC unit, which isn't really that loud to begin with. So especially if you're gonna be using headphones while you're gaming, you're really not gonna notice uh, the Wraith um, spinning up to 100% at all, especially inside of a conventional closed chassis. And on that note, before we kick it off to a sound test, you can actually hear what 100% fan speed sounds like. I did want to mention that you're also, the microphone is also going to be picking up the fan noise coming from the GPU and the power supply as well. So just bear that in mind as you go about listening. So with our R7 overclocked to 3.9 gigahertz stable and our Wraith Spire cooler now operating at 100% fan speed, I jumped once again into GTA 5 just to see how much lower the temperatures on our CPU would be. And what we found was with just GTA 5, no background applications, just the game alone, uh, we were seeing temperatures now in the high 40s. That's actually really good, especially running overclocked and all that when you consider everything. Um, I will say that idling temperatures are are oddly high. We were seeing like high 30s and low 40s um, just at idle. And so the fact that we're, we're only raising like seven to 10 degrees jumping into a game is kind of interesting. I'm not exactly sure if the idling temps are high or if the overclocking temps are low. Uh, it's just uh, just kind of strange, but uh, that that is only that is only like that only answers part of the question because the R7 1700 is really appealing to gamers who want more than just gaming who are actually doing uh, multi-threaded applications like live encoding if you're gonna be gaming while streaming, maybe editing your videos at the same time. So I decided to retest um, with GTA 5 still running, but this time streaming it out to 720p at 60 frames per second, as well as having a couple of Chrome tabs open as well, just to see exactly how much the, te the temperatures spike up. And sure enough, we did see it increase going from the high 40s again to uh, the 50s and 60s now. So I was monitoring these temperatures within AMD uh, Ryzen Master, by the way, so I don't know, I still don't know, it's still too early to tell just how reliable that uh, application is for monitoring temps, but that's really all I had on hand at the moment, so just bear that in mind going into these numbers. Uh, so g g getting into the 50s and 60s, I mean, that's still very reasonable considering that we're almost overclocked to 4 gigahertz here. Now, I did try to overclock to 4 gigahertz, however, the voltage required to hit that, at least on my particular chip, uh, which was 1.3625. That's actually what I got away with when I was using using that Noctua cooler uh, in the other video. That voltage uh, was introducing too much heat for the Spire to really handle. Um, and so what we saw was a little bit of thermal throttling once we got up to like the high 70s, and then all of a sudden it just auto fail safed and shut down. I mean, it just crashed from instability or, or from getting too hot to prevent any sort of damage from happening. And uh, that was kind of a bummer. So we didn't quite 
uh, we're not quite able to hit that four gigahertz mark with the Spire, at least with my chip. You guys might be might fare better in the Silicon Lottery and whatnot and be able to hit four gigahertz no problem with this cooler, but at least in my testing setup today, I was unable to do so. So that sort of leads me into how I feel about the Spire overall, and we can kind of wrap this video up, is that if you aren't trying to hit the utmost highest overclock with your R7-1700, then the Spire is a perfectly sound solution that is incredibly quiet for what it is, and actually offers some really decent thermals, especially on, you know, it, it is a 65 watt TDP chip with a 95 watt TDP cooler. So you do have that additional headroom if you did want to overclock. You just might not be able to, to squeeze every last ounce of performance out of your CPU as you might with, say, a higher end aftermarket air cooler, like a tower cooler, for example, or of course, a liquid cooled option. But overall, a very solid value add from AMD that I think is gonna save a lot of users a nice chunk of change on an aftermarket cooler. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is that the Spire is a downward firing cooler, so you're gonna be exhausting hot air at completely different directions all over inside your case. But as long as you have the proper airflow path that's going through your chassis, you know, you've got some nice intake fans, maybe a couple exhausts at the top and the rear, then that should pretty much redirect and refocus that exhausted air from the cooler out the appropriate um, uh, exits of your chassis. So that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. Let me know what you think about the Spire so far in the comments, and also feel free to toss me a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Have a good one, guys. I hope you all have a lovely weekend or whenever or weekday. Depending on when I post this video, I'm not sure. But uh, yes, thank you all so much for watching. As always, feel free to check out some of the links in the description, uh, ways that you can help support the channel. There's my store. You can subscribe to Bitwit Ultra. But I'm going to get out of here, guys. So have yourselves a very good day, and I'll see y'all in the next video.